Hello, and um, thank you for your interest in research uh, going on at Keele University. My name is Dr Helen Parr, and I'm a senior lecturer in international relations. And I'm going to talk now about um, some of the research that I've been carrying out. This is about British experiences and memories of the 1982 Falklands War. This short presentation is called Reevaluating the 1982 Fal Falklands Conflict, War, Memory and Commemoration. On 2nd of April 1982, Argentine forces landed at Port Stanley, the capital of East Falkland, and occupied the town. The sovereignty of the Falkland Islands was in dispute. Britain's claims to the title rested on the fact that Britain had been in control of the islands undisturbed since 1833. There was no indigenous population, and the people who lived there were mainly British settlers, 1,763 of them in 1982, and they wanted to remain under British jurisdiction. In the 1960s and the 1970s, the British Foreign Office was interested in finding a formula to hand the islands to Argentina, but the islanders had resisted this and talks had reached an impasse. From Argentina's perspective, Argentina had inherited the islands from Spain. The islands were an important part of Argentina and Britain's presence in the area was outdated European colonialism. Argentina's stance had a great deal of support in the United Nations, but in 1982, Argentina was ruled by a military dictator, General Galtieri, and his decision to invade changed everything. As soon as Britain learned of the invasion, the British government, headed by Margaret Thatcher, agreed that they had to dispatch a task force. Britain had been humiliated. The House of Commons met in an emergency session on, on Saturday the 3rd of April. Michael Foote, the leader of the Labour Party, said that the people of the Falkland Islands have the absolute right to look to us at this moment of their desperate plight. They are faced with an act of naked, unqualified aggression. To allow Argentina to take over the islands would be to appease Galtieri, and Britain's role in world politics would never be the same again. On 5th of April, a fleet began to set sail to make the 8,000-mile journey into the South Atlantic. The Americans established a negotiating mission under Secretary of State General Alexander Haig. Haig had fought in Vietnam, and he wanted to avoid war. The British did initially make concessions, but the Argentine junta were disorganised and unreliable, and reluctant to concede the gains that they had won through force. Late in April, Britain's Foreign Secretary, Francis Pym, returned from Washington with a deal that he wanted to accept. This deal would have resulted, most likely, in the eventual return of the islands to Argentina, but it would have brought the immediate cessation of hostilities. It was a critical moment. Margaret Thatcher, as recently released documents from her archive confirm, did not want to accept this compromise. She believed that Britain should be prepared to use its military force to guarantee the rights of the islanders and to prove that aggression could not gain the upper hand in international politics. She also knew that her parliamentary supporters would reject the deal. She knew that compromise, associated as it now was with her foreign secretary, would mean the end of her political career. Even the most determined British conciliation might not, at this point, have been able to avert war, because Argentina could still have rejected a deal. But as it was, this was the turning point. A few days later, the British submarine HMS Conqueror sunk the Argentine ship, the General Belgano, and armed conflict became inevitable. British forces landed on the islands on the 21st of May. The land war was short and bloody. British troops were involved in some of the most intense close quarters combat that Britain had experienced since the Korea Korean War in 1950. On the 14th of June, Argentina surrendered and British sovereignty was restored. Britain's victory was unambiguous and complete. In Argentina, Galtieri was forced out and within a year, democracy was restored. In Britain, Margaret Thatcher's personal popularity was transformed by Britain's military triumph as you can see from the figures on the slide. And this is one reason why the war had such symbolic importance in British politics. The Conservatives won the 1983 general election in a landslide victory. And the images associated with Thatcher's role in the Falklands, her strength, her resolution, her authority, became indelibly connected with everyone's ideas of the changes that Britain underwent in the 1980s. And it is to the aftermath of the war that this presentation now turns. This picture here shows the Armed Forces Memorial at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire. The Arboretum was opened in 2001 as a site for commemoration of those who have died in military service since the end of the Second World War. The existence of the Arboretum shows how important commemoration of war has become in Britain, 
and also it shows how enduring the commemoration of war is. On the 8th of July 1982, Margaret Thatcher announced that bodies of servicemen would be repatriated to Britain for the families of those requesting it. This was a major and in some ways unexpected change in British military tradition and it turned out to mark a break with the past that now looks unlikely to be revoked. During the World Wars and in the wars of Cold War and decolonisation that followed the Second World War, the British military dead had been buried in military cemeteries in the countries where they had fought and died, Rupert Brooke's corner of a foreign field that is forever England. In part, the burial of the dead where they fell was practical, as during the World Wars it would have been exceptionally costly and time-consuming to bring bodies home. It also reflected a military view that the man should be honoured for his part in the campaign. At the point of his death he was a military man and his burial alongside his other fallen comrades confirmed this in perpetuity. Thatcher's announcement was a reaction to a strong campaign from families of servicemen who had died, a campaign that was supported by the tabloid press. These families wanted repatriation for different reasons. A very small number opposed the war and wanted the bodies brought home because they felt that the war had been unnecessary and that the body belonged to the family, not to the military, nor to the government. Many more felt that the Falkland Islands were a long way away and that it would bring them comfort to be able to tend the grave of their son or husband near to home. Others were concerned that if the Falkland Islands returned to Argentina, their son's body would be in foreign soil and under the jurisdiction of a government unlikely to be sympathetic to their fate. More still did not know what to think, and were not sure where they would prefer the body to lie. Thatcher was very concerned after the war that she should not be seen as heartless nor militaristic. She wanted to grant families their wish in order to show sympathy with their loss. In addition, the numbers involved were not too great. 255 British servicemen died in the Falklands. Of these deaths, 174 had been at sea and these bodies could not be recovered. Of the remainder, 64 families opted to bring the bodies home. Two bodies remained where they had fallen. One was brought home a year later, and 14 were reinterned in a new military cemetery, pictured here, that was built by San Carlos Water, where troops had come ashore. The bodies arrived back in the UK on the 16th of November, 1982. They arrived to no ceremony, a lone piper played a lament, and the bodies were returned to their families or to the military cemeteries where they were to be buried. Those families whose relatives had died at sea were offered the chance to travel to the Falkland Islands. Funded by the Ministry of Defence, many did so in April 1983. In other ways, the commemoration of the Falklands was very traditional, although it was also strongly contested. Thatcher did want to celebrate Britain's victory and also wanted to comfort the families of the dead by recognising and acknowledging the sacrifice that they had made. She proposed a memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral, a memorial service that would celebrate the liberation of the Falkland Islands. The Church of England, however, felt that Thatcher was too triumphalist in the aftermath of the war and wanted to emphasise not so much victory as peace and reconciliation. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Runcie, insisted that the service should be interdenominational, which of course would include Catholic participation, and Argentina was a, a country with a strong Catholic population. The Pope had recently emphasised the importance of reconciliation rather than victory, and one religious leader wanted to read the Lord's Prayer in Spanish. The leader of the Methodist Conference, Reverend Kenneth Greet, had openly opposed the war, and the Dean of St Paul's was known to have pacifist sympathies. The government and the church, therefore, disagreed on just about everything about the service, including what should be read and who should read it. In the end, they turned it simply the Falkland Island Service, and it was a service for thanksgiving and for remembrance. Runcie's sermon acknowledged that on occasion the use of force could not be avoided, but he also criticised nationalism and made a plea for peace rather than for war. A few days later, perhaps angry that the service had not fully reflected what she saw as the public's mood, Thatcher announced that there would be a military march past, a victory parade, in the City of London in October. The victory parade caused controversy too. Initially, the government did not consider the inclusion of disabled veterans. This omission illustrates that Thatcher's preoccupation was to commemorate Britain's triumph, but also it shows that the prevalent contemporary attitude was one of emotional restraint and one that brushed disability under the carpet. Many ordinary people were not at all surprised at the initial exclusion of the wounded. 
one man who had served in the Second World War, wrote that involving the wounded in a victory parade would be like having a display of road accident victims at the motor show. Others, however, were shocked that the disabled were left out and argued that the wounded had played a vital part in the campaign and that their sacrifice should be recognised. There was an outcry in the Houses of Parliament and subsequently wheelchair-bound veterans selected by the MOD were invited to participate in the salute. Over time, the commemoration of the war has changed. In 1982, as we've seen, the war was widely regarded as a war of domestic politics and it was thought, although it is a partial view, that it was fought to save Thatcher's government. Now, however, it is increasingly seen as a war of principle, fought not just for the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands, but in order to assert the principle that aggression should not be allowed to gain the upper hand in international affairs. Argentina had breached the peace, and Britain had to stand up against it. The idea that it was a war of principle dovetailed with contemporary explanations of British actions during the Iraq War, as Tony Blair was regarded at the time as motivated by principled ideas of using military force for humanitarian purposes. Alternatively, the Falklands came to be regarded as a just war in stark contrast to British motives over Iraq. At the same time, the Falklands War has come to be seen not as a war for the territory of the Falkland Islands, and you can see from the photo that large parts of the islands are wild and barren, but as a war of liberation, the British liberated the Falkland Islanders from Argentinian occupation. This is also a narrative that means more in the context of the Iraq War, as part of Britain's stated motivation uh, for that war was to liberate people from Saddam Hussein's tyranny. But the Falklands War was a lot less complex than Iraq, and as you can see from this photo, Thatcher Drive in Port Stanley, Falkland Islanders do generally feel very grateful to the British for repelling the Argentine invasion. Furthermore, as British people remember the Falklands now, more than 30 years after it happened, far greater attention is paid to the issue of post-combat trauma. At the time, post-combat trauma had only just been recognised as a condition, but now trauma and disability have indelibly become part of war. Servicemen's stories and a civilian public's understanding of what combat comprises invariably now includes post-combat trauma. This is obviously an important development in terms of giving people support after combat if they need it, but it also shows introspection about who suffers after war. The politics of life and death in war is always part of national narratives, and in these national narratives, some lives are valued more than others. We focus more on the experiences of a small number of servicemen than we do on the hundreds and thousands of people in other places experiencing daily the effects and consequences of military violence. So, in conclusion, these pictures show the commemoration of British soldiers on the Falkland Islands, crosses and a cairn placed for individual soldiers. These acts of individual care and recognition, important though they are, contrast with the Argentine cemetery on the Falklands, in which half the graves are to Argentine soldier known only to God. These images show that the politics of the conflict to continue to count in the way in which war is remembered, and these images show that the politics of contemporary wars make a difference to how we think about past ones. The context of Iraq and Afghanistan has changed the way we remember the Falklands. Strangely, there seems to be great public sympathy for the armed services and respect for the job that they have to do, alongside widespread condemnation for the governments that sent them into combat. At the time, in 1982, the Falklands War was seen as Britain's last conflict, an outdated war, but now it looks like the first in a series of what are often called limited British military interventions in far-off places.